Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. You're watching Indigo Tech Tutorials. So if you're new here, please press that like button and subscribe to the channel. It'll help me out a ton so I can keep creating this awesome content. In last, uh, in, in the previous video, I was working out more on the Airbnb app and I actually added user accounts. Also this nice nav bar up at the top with the logo and a, a nice settings page too. So you'll see if we go to create a new account, I'm just going to use some random information. Whoops, my password is wrong. Let me try and do one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, yeah, I should probably change that. And then you'll see once we log in, we have this nice nav bar. We can create a new listing. But here's where we left off on the last video. We actually kind of hid the form. And we only are going to let you see it after you sign up as an owner. So right now, there's no way to really do that. But we did add this nice settings page where we can get information about the users on the site, which is kind of cool. And then we also have like the listings page, although right now we can't actually, I guess we can edit a listing, but we're not able to create a new listing because we kind of blocked down that page. So let's go ahead and start adding in the stripe connection so stripe is a framework it's really like a platform that handles all of your payments payouts and all these different things there's some really good docs and they have a ruby library too so it's kind of like really helpful this is what most of the people use that i know that do some sort of payment processing on their rails apps that's what we're going to be doing so what we need actually is a stripe account so if you don't already have a stripe account it's pretty easy. You just go and sign up and then you get a like Stripe login. And then what I'm going to do is actually create a new account, but you can just use the account that you currently have. So I, I uh, clicked up in the top right corner. I just clicked create a new account and then I'm going to put the name of the account for us would just be like Airbnb Rails. I'm going to press create. And just as simple as that, we have this new account. You'll see that I'm signed in as the Airbnb Rails account. And then right now we're just using test data. So to accept real payments, you need to complete your business profile, which is basically just adding in your address and some information about your personal, like yourself, all the things that you need to do taxes and stuff like that. So for just this video, I'm gonna keep it in test mode because then we can just test out all of the different payments, make sure that our app is working. And then obviously once you go to production, you switch out the test keys for the production keys and make sure that you fill out your profile too. So really to use Stripe, it's as simple as just taking these two keys, the publishable and the secret key, bringing them into your app, and then we can start working with the docs. But for us, we're actually gonna use Connect, which is another library, a part of Stripe, which is gonna allow us to have users connect uh, their personal Stripe accounts, and then we're able to create a marketplace kind of vibe where they're able to get paid out and then we can take it we can take transactions like on behalf of that person so it's really useful and then like I said the stripe docs is just really helpful there's a lot of information here for what you're trying to do like we can accept online payments create subscriptions receive payouts all these different things but for us we'd actually be going over to the connect section and then we're going to try to set up connect so we can collect a payout, we can pay out money. I think we're probably gonna wanna do just collect and pay out. So we collect payments from the customers and automatically pay out a portion to your sellers or service providers, which means you can take an application fee for your app. So you can like take a certain percentage of the sale and then just pay out the rest of them to their account. So things like this is, are really useful in what a lot of the big apps that we see nowadays are built on. It's just using something like this behind the scenes. So we can accept payments by creating direct charges. So that's probably what we could do, although that's gonna directly transact with the connected account. So we might wanna do destination charges. So I think with destination charges, you can actually split the payment between multiple accounts. So if you have like users that, maybe you have two users who are sharing a product and then you wanna split the proceeds, you could do stuff like that with a destination charge. But we'll get into that later. 
But right now we're just going to want to have the basic setup for Stripe Connect Marketplace, which would probably just be collect and pay out. And then we can choose what sort of code we want to have. I'm just going to go for the web because they already have this Ruby example. So we can get the Stripe gem, then create an account for the user. Create an account link so this is so that the user can go and enter in more information. And then we get to the accepting a payment where we'd add a checkout on the page, which has a success URL, cancel URL, and just like a few different things. Also in here in payment intent data, we can do stuff like the application fee amount, and then also the destination, which this is actually creating that destination charge. And it'll go to that account ID that we created back up here, because you get an account ID or the account that we're going to create. So it's like a few different things that we're going to have to set up. And yeah, then we can put it all together and test this out. So it shouldn't be that hard. And we can just get started following this documentation. And yeah, get into the video. All right, so the first thing that we're going to do is set up Stripe in our app. So first thing I'm going to do is bring over the credentials. So to do this, I'm going to make a credential file using the built-in Rails credentials. So what we have to do is create a credential file for the environment that we're in. And we can do that by first specifying the editor like this. This is going to be a parameter into the command. So we say editor and then you could say vim. You could even say code. So like VS code if we want to do it that way. That might be a bit easier for beginners. And then we can type in Rails credential colon edit. Then we're going to do dash dash environment equals, then this would be the environment that we're going to be in. So for us, it's development. Just press enter. And just like that, we're inside of a credential file right here. And here's where we're going to add our keys. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a stripe key like that. Then I'll go in new line and I'll set public key. I'll just say PK for short. And then I'll paste in my public key and we can go back here and we're going to get the private key or the secret key so you can only reveal this one time so you kind of have to be careful but since we're just having it in our app although this isn't visible every time you open this file you need to have the correct key or else you're not able to see it so that's kind of the cool thing that's built in so just like this i have my public and my secret key and then all we can do is just exit out and it should have saved successfully. So see file encrypted and saved. And now we have those keys, which is great. The next thing is to configure Stripe. So we can do that by first getting the gem and then we're gonna configure it onto the Stripe gem. So to make this a little bit more helpful, I'm just gonna look up the Stripe gem and pull up the docs so I can see some more information. So we're gonna add Stripe like this. And then there should be a way to configure the Stripe library, set our key, so that we don't have to do it every time. I don't see it though, whoops. All right, let's not worry about it. It's easy enough as just adding this Stripe gem. So I'll do this from the console by typing in bundle add Stripe. I'm just gonna zoom in here a little bit. So you'll see that we got Stripe and it installed that Stripe gem. That's perfect. And then from here, I just wanna figure out how I can set the Stripe. Let me look that up. Fill it with the following. So yeah, that's kinda what I was thinking is we need something like this. All right, so now let's go ahead and open up our app. So we can do code dot, open up uh, the code editor. And inside of here, I'm gonna go into config initializers and I'll create a new file called stripe.rb. And inside of here, we can paste in this information where we're gonna set, uh, this is actually interesting. <laughs> 
What is this? Rails configuration dot stripe? I've never seen this. That's kind of weird. I don't. I don't really like this guy's way of doing it. Oh, also it was posted in 2016. Wow. Yeah, guys, be careful what you enter in. I know I've done it before. Maybe it's not that important. Have to create a stripe initializer file. Do we really do it like this? Rails configuration dot stripe. That's crazy. Okay, well, I guess we can do this, but we're going to replace these values with rails.application credentials dig stripe pk for our publishable key and then sk for the secret key. And then apparently we set the API key just with the thing that we just set up here. It doesn't really make much sense. But okay. Now that we have the Stripe gem installed, the next thing would be to create a Stripe account for the user. So with controller properties, with account type. No, we don't want to do account type. So I guess we have to do this somewhere inside of our app. So maybe on the owner sign up controller, we could have like a link that says get started. Oh, it looks like the server was off. So I'm going to restart the server bin slash dev. Yeah. So I think I might have a link that says like get started. And then when you click that, it will automatically create that Stripe account for you. If you don't have it, we could probably get started with something like that. So let's add a create action to our owner sign up, and that'll be where the link kind of posts to. And then we can go into our routes to owner sign up and then let's permit the create route. Now, I don't know if this is going to be the permanent flow for our app because we might want to do it right as soon as they sign up. But I think this is this will work for now. And then we can rethink it later if we need to. So we'll go to owner sign up show page and I'm going to add a link. Actually, I'm, I want to display it on top of this image. So what we can do is add a div. Put a class of relative, just do that around the image. And the image is gonna take up the space that it needs. And then we'll have our link to, which might say like get started. Now, this is gonna go to just owner sign up path. And then for class, we do absolute top zero. And then I think on this div, we're also have flex item center justify center, which in the past I've seen this work to center the div, even though it's absolute. Let's see. Okay, no, we still get the link way up here. Get started now. Uh, what went wrong? Let's add a background on this too. UG white, rounded large, and then with the border. Oops, whoa. Okay, I guess I have a few windows open. Let me fix that. Put it all in the same window. Okay, so we do see it up there, but it's not in the right spot. Add some padding. And yeah, it looks like maybe I should delete the top zero and just go absolute. See what that looks like. Okay, now it looks like the centering does work. And then I think what would be cool is if when we hover on the image, maybe like the background changes. That would look kind of cool. So we could do a hover um, opacity 75, maybe. So that's actually like decreasing the opacity. So it makes it more transparent. I guess that's not really what I was thinking. I have seen something. How do we do this? Make the image darker. Brightness, that's what it is. Let me find the quickly I'll find the class for brightness. I think it's literally just brightness like that. So hover brightness 75. Yeah, I was remembering I've done this in the past. Okay, see, yeah, it looks kind of nice, and then it even 
it like kind of makes you want to click the button even more. Although I want it, it looks like when we hover on the button, the styling goes away, which I don't like that. I want it to stay. So what we can do to fix that is instead of doing hover, we need to do a group hover. And then on the element that's containing the items, put a group. So then even when you hover on the link, it'll still apply that effect. Kind of a nice thing as part of Tailwind. So yeah, you can see this looks pretty good. It might even be fun to make like the border turn a different color when you hover on the link itself. So we could do that by changing just simply the styling on the link. Do a hover state. Border. Actually, let me go to a new line. That's the only thing with Tailwind. It's like, it's fast, I guess, but... And it takes up so much space on the in the HTML. Oh, okay, that changed something unexpectedly. I think I accidentally got rid of the P2 for the padding. All right, there we go. Okay, hover, it goes to a new color. That's actually not too bad. Maybe even doing a shadow would be nice. Shadow. Something like that. It's kind of a lot. <laughs> it's definitely a lot. Maybe just only the shadow. I don't know. And then if we want it to be more smooth when it comes in, we could do transition. All duration 250. And then it kind of just pops in. We could also have it affect, we could have it come in when you hover on the image as well. If we did a group hover instead of hover, just simply this group hover, group hover, and now it comes in when you hover, and then maybe when you when you hover on the link, we could change the border or something. I don't know. We already tried this, but like we could try it again. So it's it's kind of like showing you. you should click on it and then. You hover and it actually changes or we could change the color too we could go crazy i know we're kind of going crazy on the ui right now but sometimes it's fun to do this so maybe i'll invert the colors so we'll have like red text and then like light text and then a red background oh wait hover whoops i need i meant to do a light red This looks so crazy. It looks kind of like evil or like because <laughs> it's all red, you know? Some people think differently about it. This is interesting. And there's like really so much styling that you could get into. I don't know if I like this. And then obviously it takes up so much space on the front end. Like this is just insane. Maybe we'll do hover, order, or no shadow. Transparent, not border shadow. <laughs> Just shadow, transparent. Hide that red shadow when you hover over it. It's like it pops up, but then it goes away. Although I don't think it actually goes away. I think it's still there. Anyways, when you click on it right now, nothing happens. I don't even see anything here. I think it just goes to the same page, basically. But I'm going to turn it into... A post request so right now it just makes a get request like every other link but if we add data turbo method that that's a post just like this now it's gonna make a post request so when you would click that started post to owner sign up and then we could do whatever we need to do there so I'm gonna go over to the controllers go to owner sign up controller and then inside of here I'm gonna say like current user dot create stripe account and then this is going to be a method i'm going to define on the user model so we go over to models user and inside of here i'll do def create stripe account and this is where i'm going to create the account for the user so let's come back in here into the guide and it was just this part right here or we'll go ahead and paste that in stripe account create controller and then I guess there's like some parameters that I don't even really understand. Oh, one thing is type express. We don't actually want that. 
So we might need to look into more about this information, specifying the connected account properties. Let's right click on this, open a new tab, and let's look more into these properties because I haven't seen these before. These must be new to the Stripe. See, it says migrate your connection or your connect integration to use controller properties. I guess that's like the new thing. And that essentially it just goes over like a few things like what would happen if there was, let's say losses uh, for like credit fraud, whatever uh, we could say Stripe. <laughs> I don't get it. We could default value is Stripe. Well, what do you what do you guys think? I think it would be better if Stripe could handle that type of stuff, so I don't have to worry about fraud. But we're still liable for a negative balance. Okay. Well, let's try not to go negative. Controller fees payer. Either application the Connect platform pays all Stripe fees, or the account pays all Stripe fees directly. So we might want to think of that. By default, it's the account pays the Stripe fees. The Stripe fees shouldn't be that much either. It's just like a little bit. But that's interesting how they have all these different settings. Then we have dashboard type, express, can access the full, the account can't access the express or Stripe. So one thing to note is that uh, we should leave it at full. It looks like a lot of these are defaulted anyways. But if you go express, they charge you like $5 per each account per month or something crazy like that. And if you're not ready to do an ex express, I think is like it allows you to or maybe it's custom. Anyways, one of these options, they cost a lot more money than just standard. So type. I think we might just want to like get rid of these controller actions and just leave them to default. Stripe account create. There's definitely more options to choose from than just those controller types. So we want to look more into the account create itself. Like this is just with nothing. Oh, that's kind of what we have right now. But I want to change this. And then this is what we get back. Let's look more at the Stripe account class. So we can see what other options we have. Like maybe we can pass in some of the information we already have about the user. So let's go over to the accounts API and we can take a look at what's going on here. So create an account. This is what we're looking for. So we can put in country, email. So these are some things that we do have. Like we definitely have their email. Although we don't know if they want to use like a different email for their strip account, but it would probably be the same. I guess it's really not that much information here when you think about it. So I don't know. Let's just see what we get back. We get this response with an ID and that's probably like what we'd mostly need. Obviously, we'll take a look at that once we get to it, but we should have the ID. So I guess we can just do something like creating the account with nothing right now. Direct account equals this. And then I want to take a look at this afterwards. So I'm going to do binding pry. Now, the thing about binding pry is that it doesn't work with bin dev. It's kind of annoying, and I'm still looking for an option that will work. I just haven't found it, but we can add pry by adding bundle add pry rails. And now we have pry, although to test it out, we need to do rails s basically. And then I'm going to come in here, reload, click this, and then right away, no API key provided. So we did set the API key. Maybe I just forgot to restart the server. Although no, I definitely just started that. So why did the Stripe initializer not go through down here? 
secret key. Let's try to access this in the terminal. And then if we're not able to access it, it means it's not set properly. Yeah, it's not set properly. Are we able to access this? No. Weird. So the credential doesn't have access to Stripe or anything. So I'm going to quickly go and try to open the credentials. I'm going to do it using Vim. And there's nothing there. Oh, I wonder if using Visual Studio Code actually made it not work. That's what it's looking like. <laughs> we can open recent and we might be able to find it. It looks like right here. Open. But apparently there was no way to like... Oh, maybe I forgot to press Control S to save it. Because I just kind of exited out. I didn't know what to do. But we definitely need to right quit. Alright, now let's reload. Get started now. It says you can only create new accounts if you signed up for Connect. Oh, so we haven't signed up for Connect yet. So at least this message is pretty helpful. And just tells us to go to this URL to sign up for Connect. Although I don't see where we sign up for it, but I guess let's just click on here and then choosing the onboarding. We can send connected accounts to a Stripe hosted onboarding flow. This is probably what we want actually because, or we could do an API, we could do an embedded if we want to keep the user on our site. Which maybe we want to try that because I haven't tried that one yet. As long as it's still free. I just feel like I tried to do one of these a few years ago and it, they started charging me for the accounts and it was really annoying. But I think that's just because of the Stripe or Express kind of thing. So I think we do want to provide them to the Stripe dashboard just in case they want to, you know, like check more about their payouts, refunds, whatever. Because if you do none, that means that they just don't have access to it at all. Which we could do both. There's, it's cool that there's so many options now. I'm probably just gonna have to walk through here and then choose what I wanna do. I kinda wanna do embedded, because that means we could just display a little pop-up for Stripe inside of our app, which would probably be the best way to do it. All right, everybody, so back to where we were with the app. I was just resolving an issue with the Stripe API key not showing up. So now we should be able to access that. If we go into the Rails console and then we try to get this key. Okay, you'll see that that is the secret key. You're not supposed to share that with anybody. But I'm letting you guys see it because, you know, I'm not worried about that right now. So now that we have the key coming through, it means that Stripe is set up. Oh, and then so the other error that we were seeing when we tried to create the Stripe account from this method was actually that we hadn't signed up for connect yet. So we have to go to Stripe and go to our dashboard and make sure that we're signed up for connect. So right now, I don't think we are. Let me try to find that section. So it's right here, connect. When we get in here, okay, we don't have it. It says get started, which means we need to set up the connect side of things. So I'm just going to go through, it says the first thing, how will funds flow on your platform? So sellers will collect payments directly or buyers will purchase from you. I think sell to buyers yourself and then send payouts. It would probably be the latter because the buyers aren't going to go directly to the seller. You know, they're going through our platform because we have the Airbnb platform. So let's choose the second one and then I'll continue. So it says we have some responsibilities we have to confirm. If the buyer purchased from you, you'll be liable for refunds and chargebacks. Oh, okay. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, so if they need to do a refund or if they charge it back, it means like the charge goes on us. I guess you could choose whatever you think is right for your business, but I feel like for a platform, you're usually handling all of the payments for the seller. So the seller doesn't have to worry about that stuff. And also for other reasons like taking application fee, stuff like that. So these are our responsibilities, onboarding, 
few other things, that's fine. Let's connect, and then it asks, how will sellers be paid out? By the way, this setup process is way different than it was a few years ago when I last was working with Stripe. Now it's more like GUI and this whole like step process they have to go through, which is kind of different. So it says send individual payouts or split them between multiple sellers. Okay, so are we going to pay them individually or are we doing multiple sellers per product kind of thing? Now for us, we're just going to be paying out to one seller. So that's all we need. Although I don't know why we have to select this now. It never used to be like this. And then it says select the industry that best matches your business. So are we doing... Well, it, the funny thing is it has all the names of the companies. They literally have an Airbnb one right here for travel. So let's click on that. And it says where will sellers create their account? Onboarding hosted by Stripe. Yep, I think that's what we're going to do. The other ones are embedding and onboard component which i guess we kind of i did want to do that too so we don't have to redirect on the stripe and then there's also build your own api and then so like use their api to build your own front end for signing up which might be cool if you're trying to have total uh control over the sign up process which a lot of apps do like that i don't really care i'll just go with the embedded option so it still is inside of our app but we don't have to do very much coding for like custom front end like we like that one would be okay and then where, where will sellers manage their account so we can choose one of these express dashboard or embedded account components oh that's another good one how about we go with the embedded because it'll stay inside of our platform but we don't have to do a lot of front end code all right then i'll continue let's keep continuing hopefully that was it Okay, so we got through, tell us about your platform step. Now we have to activate the account. So let's do that. Get started with activating. It looks like they might ask me some personal information. Also, it looks like they're talking about a bank eventually. Okay, guys, I finally finished with all of the personal information. They basically asked me about like my address, my personal social security number, and then also about the business address. The business name they told me to add in like the domain so whatever domain you're planning on using for your app just put that in and then like this doesn't really matter because we're just testing right now but for some reason they still want you to add in all this information but after we added the bank too so i had to put my real like routing and account number in here and then now we get on to the next step which is like tax calculation climate contributions so these are if you want to like, you know, take care of taxing and then also contributing to climate. So this one might be good, like, see, because everybody cares about the climate and I personally do. So I think I would donate like 1%. 1% sounds so small. You know what I mean? I would probably do more than that. But it looks like they can just automatically do this if you want to take care of climate and then also tax basically like do you want to tax your items because we're going to need to do this anyways anyway but i'm just going to skip for now because that's an option and then i guess for climate i'll continue with one percent all right so now that we got that all sorted out i just submitted that and it looks like we should be good to go so now to figure out if we have connect set up we can try to navigate back to the connect area and we should see some new things so I'm actually feeling kind of lost. Where's the connect area? Yeah. Even now. Customers. Oh, right here. Okay, so they moved the connect area out a little bit. And it looks like we actually have two steps left. So we have to verify an identity document. This is all new. I've never had to do this before. So I guess I have to con uh, continue. Yeah. I'll be right back. I have to put in my ID, basically. Hello everybody, All right, we're going to continue on this adventure trying to set up Stripe Connect in our app and we essentially already have it set up. We created an account for that user but from there we need to link a few more things like we need the user to go and fill out their information and like set up a Stripe account and everything. So I'm going to sign back in to the account I created yesterday because that one already has a Stripe account ID. 
and then I'll go to the new listing page. And what I want to do right now is update this UI when you've already filled out some information. Like when you've already clicked this button, you've created the Stripe account. From there, we need to show different UI and just tell them that they need to go and fill out their information. So to accomplish all of this, let's go into the views. Let's go to the owner sign up view that we created on the show page. And then inside of here, we just have to change a few things, which maybe we could just change this bottom section. We can check if current user .stripe account ID dot present. This is going to check is it not nil. We don't even really need the present part. We could just say like if the yeah, Stripe account ID because otherwise it would be nil. And then already we're going to show something else. So we're not going to show this image anymore unless we wanted to. I think from here, I'll probably just have like another div. Maybe like a little div with a slightly darker background. And then inside of this container, we could put like another P and just say, fill out some information. Just set up your payment processing. Obviously, this text could be fine-tuned to whatever you whatever type of message you're trying to display but yeah, that's probably fine for now let's reload we get something that looks like this okay it's pretty ugly let's try to squeeze it down looks like there wasn't really any fixed width on this which is kind of interesting but it did do a flex justify center but the image doesn't even have any fixed width which is kind of interesting Let's just do a max width 2XL. And then we can do MX auto, which should push it into the center. All right, so that looks like okay. And then we could do some padding. Accomplish that with a P2. And it should look great. Okay. So that looks fine. Maybe we can add a break. So inside of our conditional, actually, I'm going to add the break. So inside the if. So that it only displays it when it's showing this other element. We're going to have that little bit of break in between the content. It says you need to fill out some information to set up your payment processing. And then we can have a link to finish sign up now. Now I don't know where this link's going to go. Because we need to we need to create that Stripe account link, so we might just have to already like do this inside of here. Let's add some styling at least. For this, I guess maybe like BG White. Since it's Airbnb, we're gonna kind of make it like red. So we do border of red and see what that looks like. We have this finish sign up now kind of sticking to the text so let's add another break between these elements all right now it just says you need to fill out some information finish sign up now weirdly the padding is not really taking effect on the link too much so maybe we'll increase the padding to p4 okay reload and this looks fine so finish sign up now and then we click on this it should redirect us to stripe which right now it's not so I'm going to quickly pull up the Stripe Connect documentation just so I can take a better look at this. So I don't think we're going to do it here. Let me try to figure out where it is. Embedded onboarding. Isn't this where we are trying to do it? Show a localized onboarding form that validates data. I guess that is kind of what we're trying to do we need the onboarding section so we could either redirect them to stripe or we could do it embedded so i kind of want to do the embedding so let's create an account and pre-fill information 
let's just see, create a connected account. And it's just as simple as that. So we already did this. If you know the country for your connected account, you can provide that information when you create the account. Okay, so that's pretty easy. And we do know the country, but we can get to setting that in a second. Now I have to determine the information to collect upfront or incrementally. Upfront onboarding collects the eventually due requirements for the account, while incremental onboarding only collects the currently due requirements. So, and then there's some like advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> disadvantages of incremental onboard connected accounts quickly results in a higher onboarding rate. And then we just have to get more information about them later. <laughs> so I guess there's two options, either get it all at once or just get it incrementally, which means you can get a little bit of information at first and then later on you can get more. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create another method on the model and I'm just gonna call it, like you know how we have that create Stripe account method on the model. I'm gonna have another one called Stripe account link. And then we should be able to just pass it in right here as the URL to this link too. So now we have to go over to the user model and define that new method. So I'm gonna go down on a new line and I'm gonna create a method called Stripe account link. And inside of here, we would take the Stripe account that we get with the ID and we would get the account link. So to do that, I'm going to go back to the docs. Let's see. Stripe posting. Oh, so this is what the Stripe posting is. We get the account link. So I guess that's what I was looking at before. But if we do an embedded onboarding, I think we would do it differently. We actually create an account session and then we initialize some JavaScript with the session. Okay, that is a lot different. Okay, so it's really up to us. Do we want to like, redirect them over to Stripe or do we want to do it embedded? I'm actually fine with doing it either way. But I guess let's do it embedded because that's just more fun. All right, forget the account link. Let's just delete that. And then what we'll do is we'll just have a div right here that we load that Stripe onboarding session into. And to do that, we'll use stimulus.js. So let's add a data controller and we'll just call it like, I don't even know, Stripe, Stripe onboarding, onboarding controller. I guess that's fine. And I'll go to the console. I'm going to run the rail feed stimulus command, which all it really does is create the stimulus controller. It doesn't even like, uh, there's a few different ways you can set up your app, but right now, because we're using this index.js, we're just eager loading the controllers. Uh, sometimes in rails apps, they have to like manually basically name each of these controllers. They need to import them in this index file. But the way that this app is set up, we don't have to do that. So actually we don't need to use the generator command if we don't want to, but it'll just give us like this basic setup like this. It'll give us a connect and it'll also create the export class, like the basic framework. So I guess I'll do it from the command. I'll just type Rails G stimulus and then stripe dash onboarding. This will create that stimulus controller. And then I'll go ahead and start the server again. But let's go into the code. Let's go to stripe onboarding controller and the stimulus controller. And then right here on the connect is where we would start working on loading this stripe session. So what we need to get is we need to get this account session and then we need to pass 
basically if you see what's happening is we do this in the back end we create the stripe account session and then in the front end we're actually creating like stripe connect instance after creating the account session and initializing connect.js you can render the account onboarding component so I don't know what initialize connect.js is it looks like that's pretty important so we need to set up connect.js wow I've never done this yet that's interesting it's saying that we should use npm but we're not using npm because we're using import maps but we should be able to use import maps it looks like what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to return this client secret after we create the account session and then on the front end we fetch the client secret and then basically initialize or we we load connect and initialize with the publishable key and the client secret there's actually not too much just a few things that we're going to implement so first would be the route for creating this account session and then also we need the stripe connect.js library let me try to add this library real quick using import maps so I'll type dot slash bin slash import map pin stripe slash connect.js okay perfect so it worked we were able to get connect.js no problems there now for the account session route let's go and create that real quick so I'll go to I guess I'll leave this for now on Stripe onboarding controller. And let's go over to the config routes RB. And inside of here, we need to figure out where we want to have that route for the account session. So we could have a full controller for it, or we could just make like a method on the owner signup controller. There's a few ways that you could do it. Usually I would create a whole controller because it's not that big of a deal. It's just like one more file to have in your app and then it can organize things so let's do a whole controller let's do a resource account sessions actually we might want to do a namespace for stripe if we want to organize it more so we do a namespace for stripe so then the url here i'll do a comment it'll look like slash stripe slash account sessions like that's where we're going to be posting to and then let's say only create and then since we're already doing a plural controller name that's really fine now we just need to go and create a stripe folder for that namespace and then inside of there we create a account sessions controller the rb and then inside of here we need stripe module which actually i don't know if this will interfere with anything hopefully it'll be fine and then account sessions controller I'm just saying that because I know there is like a stripe class. I wonder if it's going to throw an error because of this. It probably will. And then let's do that create action. And inside of the create action, we would simply run this code for the stripe account session. We could say like account session equals this. But then you'll notice we have the stripe class like. I don't know if this is gonna break. It probably might. Okay, and then for the account ID, we're gonna get that from the current user. Stripe account ID. And then we have the different components, external account collection. I don't I think this should be fine. Now let's look at the example. Looks like all they're doing is returning this client secret to JSON. So let's go ahead and do the same. Just like this. And let's put it in a render JSON like here. And I don't even think we need to JSON. Client secret, account session, client secret. Okay, that should be good. Now on the front end, we would make a, re a request to the server and we'd get that client secret back. And then we're gonna load, connect and initialize. Okay, and then we also have to import it. So let's go ahead and add this into Stripe onboarding controller. Right up at the top, we're gonna import this load connect and initialize and then inside of the connect is where we're going to run that code so let me just copy both of these things all right so where we create the payment component and then first we have to initialize so we're going to use the publishable key so 
So what I usually do for the punishable key is I'll just put it up inside of the meta tags in the HTML and then I can read it from there. We can just say publishable key and then we can say let publishable key equals document head query selector made a name right pk and then dot content and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass that into the header section we go to the views layouts application dot html to your b inside of here we can do made it up here right pk and then content would be that publishable key that we can get from Rails application credentials dot dig stripe pk. Let's close it off, and just like that, we're going to be able to pass that into our JavaScript code. We could also pass it directly through like a data attribute, but I'm just doing it like this, I guess. Now we have the publishable key. Now for the client secret, we're going to need to have that real quick. So client secret. We're going to get this from posting to the server. So I'm pretty sure we already have request.js. We used that in a previous episode when we're implementing direct upload. So let's import post from browse request.js. And then we can just post to get that client secret. So let's do a async. And then we'll do const response equals await post. The URL. So now we need that URL. I guess we can just hard code it right here. Just say like slash stripe account sessions. And then, right, we're not even going to pass in a body or anything. It's literally just going to post and then we're going to use the current user that's already signed in via the cookies to authenticate and get their correct stripe account. So, like, it's pretty simple actually. And then to get the JSON, we just say await. Oh, JSON. I'm gonna call it JSON data, I guess. And then to get the client secret, client secret equals JSON data. Whatever we called it back here, we just called it client underscore secret. All right. Pass it in. Then we create the payment component. And what we could do is we could just say this dot element append child payment component. So now we're going to add that embedded component onto the page. So let's put it all together and see if it works. Let's reload. Inspect. Look in the console for logs. Okay, I don't see anything. All right, now we get an error. To initialize connect embedded components, you must either provide either a client secret. Oh, do we not? Let's try to log the client secret. Main request client secret is let's paste it out. It does have it, look. It's actually the client secret. That's crazy. It's still being annoying. Fetch client secret. Oh, because I passed in fetch client secret. It was expecting a function. So maybe we should make it into a function. Hey, what is this? Okay, let me install this because I've this has been bugging me in every video of whenever I've been editing. Okay, don't show again. <laughs> fetch client secret. Okay, let's try to just instead of fetch client secret because we've already fetched it. Let's just pass in client secret like that. Now let's reload. It looks like it was working, but then said the Stripe Connect payments component is not enabled. So we'll make authenticated requests on its behalf. We are interrupting the request and will not send a reply. What? The Stripe's Connect Payments component is not enabled. What does that mean? Let's look that up. So I guess we have to request the appropriate capabilities. Apparently we weren't doing it yet. No, we said embedded components. Just saying. 
Let's look at our customers. Do we even have a... Oh, let's also make sure we're in test mode <laughs> before we do any of this. And I just want to look around and see what we have. Like, Let's go to the connect section. Oh, we actually have two accounts right here. But they're both restricted. Maybe that's why it's not working. So let's view the requirements. Add missing information, onboarding and verification. Okay, so I know it needs information, but that's why I'm trying to render the onboarding form. <laughs> and it just says the Stripe Connects payment component is not enabled. Data later disabled. Let's look that up. Error codes. Let's look up Stripe Connect JS. This error. I think Stripe Connect JS is really new because I haven't even heard of that. So, like it was just implemented like barely six months ago. So I don't know. We can look in the issues. This is kind of weird. Stripe Connect instance, create payments. So that is what we're doing. Oh, wait, why are we doing create payments? We're supposed to create onboard. Okay, so that does make sense, actually. The payment component, I wasn't trying to do payments. So that's my bad. And let's have those docs get started with connect embedded components. I don't know what the payment component is then. Capture payments true, see? So like, it must have been something else. Whoops, okay, let's reload with the onboarding. It actually worked, wow. And it's funny that the styling looks pretty similar to just a basic Tailwind type of app. And we don't even need our text up here anymore. Or maybe we should hide this. What we can do is let's put it inside of the div. And then let's just replace the content after we load the account onboarding. So we can say this element in our HTML equals an empty string. Now, oh, maybe we should do it after we create the onboarding element. So we know that it's all loaded and then, okay. Yeah, I mean, that's fine. Add information to start accepting money. Okay, so let's click here, and it does the little pop-up. I mean, it probably I've never seen Stripe be this simple, but it's just like right inside. Now it says you're ready to use Airbnb. So just like that. So now like our account is basically updated and saved and everything. That's so cool. It was that easy. This is crazy because I just haven't used it in so long. So like from there, I mean, we've already onboarded them. We don't need to show them this page anymore. So how do we check? I don't even know. Let's go to the Stripe dashboard. We can look in the connect section and see if we can find any more information. Oops, I'm in the wrong app. Connect, so one thing is the status. See, before it was restricted. So we probably wanna listen for that status. And then there's also gonna be really just the status that it complete. We have to listen for that. So we have to find the, we have to set up some web hooks and just listen for updates on the user account. Okay, so I think that's how I wanna monitor the account status. So let's see if we can find some information about the connect webhooks. So right here, after looking up connect webhooks, it's right away we have 
some information about this. So it says Stripe uses webhooks to notify your application when an event happens in your account. All connect integrations to establish a webhook endpoint. Okay. There are special there are several events related to accounts that Stripe recommends listening for. So when a connected account disconnects from your platform. Occurs when a bank account or debit card is updated. Account updated, status changes. So that's probably the one we'd listen to for is like account updated. Now I just need to see, does this happen? Like does this automatically happen? Or we definitely need to set the web hooks up for Stripe for sure. But then what would happen is we construct the event we also do some authentication and then we can check the event type finally. So let's try to set up the webhook first. So to do that, let's go over to the developer section and then we can go over to webhooks, add an endpoint. And then, oh, perfect. So they do have two options, listen to events on your account or events on connected accounts. So let's do a connected accounts. And then we're gonna need a URL. So, actually, I think this is where we might wanna use the Stripe CLI to listen for new events locally, because we can't really add a URL unless we have a public site which is not in production, it's local. Oh, so we also have this option. Oh, look right here. So add an endpoint or test in a local environment. We can do Stripe login and then we can forward it to the webhook route. And then we can trigger events with the CLI. So that's pretty easy. Let's do this. The first thing we need to do is log in with Stripe. So actually you need to get the Stripe CLI. So that's the first step, download the CLI. I already have the CLI, but it's really as easy as just doing if you're on Mac, it's a brew install for this Stripe slash Stripe CLI Stripe. And then for the apt, you just run these few commands, which will set up Stripe CLI. It'll add it to your local repositories, and then you can install it just like this. Pseudo apt install Stripe. And then the next thing is to do a Stripe login. So we're going to have to log in with this account. So I'll do that right now. Type in Stripe login. Now it's going to give you like a parent code and now it'll tell you to go to this URL. Just like open it up in your browser and then we'll click allow access. So now access was granted and we have Stripe logged in. So let's get to the next step, which is to forward to the webhook URL. So we're going to need to create this URL, but if we type in Stripe listen dash dash forward to, we're going to do localhost 3000 slash webhook events let's just forward it to that so right now we don't have webhook events route but that's very easy to set up like you've already seen if we just go to the routes the rb oh we might want to namespace it too like we had for the stripe namespace i think i want to do that let's go back we'll do slash stripe slash webhooks like that okay so now we do have it in the namespace it would be as simple as just doing a resource Webhook events only create and then we need a webhook events controller you can create right now so in the app folder controller stripe folder where we have the account sessions controller but from before we're going to create a new webhook events controller and then inside of here we're going to have that what we call the module stripe Seemed like that could, that actually did work. It, there wasn't any problem by using module stripe, so that's good. Then we're gonna have a class webhook events controller, which you can inherit from application controller, and then we just have a create action. Just like so. Inside of the create action is where we would process the webhook event. So if we look at the example code right here, we get the payload. 
and get the sig header and then we do like this kind of whole bit of code which we're doing a begin so we can rescue just in case there is an error we're going to rescue for specific errors and return the status 400 so we're going to construct the event with the payload sig header and endpoint secret so endpoint secret is the secret that we get right here in the console since we're doing it locally but if if you were doing it like if you were adding an endpoint for production you'd also get the secret so we need to do is we need to take this and put it into our app. So I'm just going to do the same old credential way. So if we open up a new terminal real quick, we're going to need a new terminal anyways. And then let's edit the credentials by doing, setting the editor to vim and then typing Rails credentials, edit environment development. That's the environment we're in. And then right inside of here, I'm going to add the webhook secret, paste that in, and just like that we have our webhook secret. We actually need to start the server again because I'm using one of these windows for the Stripe listen. But just like that we will have the secret, and then we can get it by doing rel's application credentials dig stripe webhook secret wh secret, and then we'll be able to get the event. And then if there is an error, we'll just return that status and everything. And if we really want to, we can organize this, but I don't really care. I'll just leave it there for now. It's kind of a lot of code, but we can even collapse this maybe. I don't know. That's fine. Okay, so then finally we handle the event right here. Do like a case event type. Payment intent succeeded. Well, actually, I want to listen for the different events type. So, actually, the connect webhooks. I wanted to listen for event type account dot application dot the authorized, and then we also had this list of all the events. So, account dot updated. Let's listen for that. Account dot updated. But eventually, like this is getting pretty bulky, we might want to move this into a background job. Because we don't want to, also we don't want to hold up the server at all because our stri our app could be receiving multiple webhooks. And we don't ever want to like make this server jam up. So we kind of want to pass it off to another method once we figure out what we're going to need to do. So for this, I wanted to check some stuff about the account. It looks like we actually get the account passed in with the event. Connected account ID, we get from account. Okay, and then we could do stuff like whatever we need to do in the back end. So account updated, we, we might just want to have like a job for this. Like account updated job, perform later, and then pass in the event. Something like that. Now, I don't know if we can actually pass the event in just as simple as that. Like, it might get, we might lose some stuff in the conversion process because this looks like, yeah, like, I don't even know what this event is going to be if I'm being real. We're still going to need to debug a little bit. Maybe we'll do a binding pry. And then we can just pry in there. And then to use pry, we have to. Go and use Rails S instead of bin dev. And then to get that event, we need to actually trigger it. So we need to go into a new window. And we just type in stripe trigger account updated. It's gonna trigger the event, at least it should. And then in the other window, we should be getting that request in. I don't know. Trigger succeeded, but over here, oh, we get an error. Um, invalid authenticity token. Okay, so that's because in Rails, we're like by default, you're always looking for an authenticity token. So make sure that you know requests are coming from the right place from inside your app. But we actually need to skip that before action. So we do skip before action, verify authenticity. 
creature like that. And because we're already using a stripe secret to deconstruct this, so it's already secure, we don't have to worry about this, the authenticity token. All right, so I'm gonna try to get this to work. Let's trigger another event. Before action, verify authenticity has not been defined. Whoops. Let me look up the code that I need. Skip forgery protection. So maybe just like this. I'll restart the server just in case and let's see what happens. All right, we actually got it. We actually got it. Now we're inside of the pry. If we try to access the event, it looks like, let's try to get the class. It says it's a stripe event. So it's not even JSON event. Dot JSON. Let's try to access that. What methods does it have? Maybe dot data. Event dot data. Dot class. Stripe object. Okay. So the data object dot ID. So like it allows you to access everything pretty easy. What if we say event dot data to JSON? If we just say event dot to JSON, we get the JSON data. So what I'm thinking is we probably want to save this event in our database. So we could have like a webhook event model that we save the JSON to. And then we, later on inside of the background job, we could pull up the data and make sure it's all like, it's already going to be safely secured in our database. It's going to be saved. So we don't have to worry about passing it through like the Redis and things like that. So we're going to need a class for this webhook event. And then also the webhook should have an ID. We do have an ID, so we can use that to kind of organize it. So let's go ahead and create that class. So over here in this other terminal, let me make sure that I'm in my app. And I'll just do a RailsGmodel model webhook event. We're gonna have data type text, and then we'll serialize that into the JSON. And we're also gonna have the, I guess, event ID, which can be a string. And I really think that's all we're gonna need for now. Then we can just do Rails DB migrate, to migrate to the database, and then we're good. Now inside of the models, we're going to need to go and go to the models webhook event. And inside of here, we're going to add the serialize method. Serialize data. And then it does work a little bit differently now. I'm going to need to look up the reference because they changed it recently. You have to pass in the attribute name and then the class name or coder. So I wanted to just do like what, JSON, right? But I don't think that's gonna work. So to test it out, let's do rel C, go in the console. And let's do webhook event dot count. Oh look, so we actually, it's not an error, but it's a deprecation warning, I guess. Passing the coder as positional argument is deprecated and will be removed in rel 7.2. Oh, so it was just a deprecation warning, but like that's still kind of scary. So it's saying you have to pass it like this coder. I don't know why they changed it. But apparently you have to use the keyword coder now. If you don't want to get that error or that warning. And then eventually it will be an error. Right. So what we're going to do is in the webhooks controller now, you can just do webhook event.create and we're going to have the event ID it's going to be event.id I think I don't know if we can actually access it like that 
think we can event ID. And then for the whole data, we're just going to pass in data will be event to JSON. Just like that, we're going to create the event. And then we're going to take the ID so we can get the webhook event equals this. Then we can access the ID for our internal database and look it up later inside of our background job. So I'm going to quickly generate a job in the console. I'll type in Rails G job account updated. Now this is kind of just like a broad job. We'd have account updated job perform later. Passing the webhook event ID. And now we have this job over here, account updated job. We're gonna expect the event ID. Then we can look up the webhook event. That finds the event ID. And now that we have the webhook event, we also have the data, which is in JSON. And I think, I don't know if we can actually reconstruct this class. Construct event, Stripe webhook. Stripe util convert to Stripe object. <laughs> so this is kind of like silly, but if we don't want to just work with the JSON data, we can actually convert it back to the Stripe object. I don't know if this will actually work, but there's no harm in trying. So what we'll do is, I guess we'll just do that from the console. We'll go rel c in this terminal and they'll say webhook event.last.id. Webhook event.last. Oh, we don't have a webhook event. So we're actually going to need to just create a new one. And then we should get to this process anyways by doing the job. Yeah, that should be fine. So from here, we're going to run a stripe trigger account updated event and then let's just watch the show begin boom so now we're inside of our background job funnily enough let me try to see what the stripe object is and I mean it just looks like a JSON stripe class it's just a string so really the stripe object didn't really get created apparently oh maybe we need to pass in the object itself Hook event dot data. What if we have to take objects? Wait, that's weird. <laughs> it looks like it's actually a string. What the heck? So the serialize isn't working. Serialize data code or JSON isn't actually working. Maybe I have to do like serialize as a hash. I don't know. Try to reload. Webhook event dot reload. Still a string. Alright, let's try this again. Let's trigger another event. over here oh we get all this stuff can't serialize data it was supposed to be a hash but it was a string oh okay well it was supposed to be json <laughs> what am i doing wrong okay i'm saying event dot to json but because i'm trying to save it as json right like that should be fine so let's try to pass in event dot data Do this again. Let's do the stripe trigger. Okay, so now we do have a stripe object. We got to that point. 
And look, it's actually a striped object. So that's what we have to do is just pass in the data. Everything's working perfectly now. And if we get like the ID, well, I guess we don't have that. What do we have? We have the object itself. We can do stuff like dot object dot ID. And the object ID is, look at what that is. It's the user's ID. And then we could grab the object dot. We look for other stuff like payouts enabled is whether the user is able to pay, like whether we're able to pay the user or not. So now that we have this object ID, I want to see if we can query for the user and like find it by Stripe account ID. So it looks like, no, that didn't really work. Let's try to just view our last user. Check out the Stripe account ID. It looks pretty much different. So I guess we're not going to be able to use that to look up the account. But it's just because I tested it with this random thing. And I think it just like gave it a test account as a parameter. So really the way that we're going to be able to test this is to disconnect our account. So maybe we should do that off the Stripe dashboard. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's make sure that we're in test mode and then, oh, we got all these accounts. I think these are from our test creations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this account back here and let's see if we can like delete it or something. And then we can have the user re auth. Remove account right here. So it says account removed and then we're going to come back and now it says you need to fill out some information. But in the console, I think we actually have to recreate the account since we just removed the whole account. Oh, but we don't have our server. Like it doesn't know that since we don't have our connection set up correctly with those webhooks, we need we aren't even listening for like what's happening on Stripe. So I actually have to manually remove that Stripe account ID. So I can just do it by update stripe account id to nil all right so now when we go back to that page we actually just see the original ui we can click get started which is going to create our stripe account just like that and then we can reload we get the onboarding page we can go to add information and then see how this all works together. This is pretty easy. Just like that. Okay, now it's, yeah, yeah, we still have to answer a few questions, but it's embedded into our app. So they don't even have to go to a whole new website. They can just stay in the platform. They see all their stuff that they're signed in. I really like this flow right here. And you see it's pretty easy to skip through a lot of those things. Information submitted just like that. And then from there. Oh, we actually have some stuff going on. I forgot because we're supposed to be waiting for a webhook event. Oh, right here, host to the Stripe webhook events. We actually got it and I can't see what type of event it is though. Oh, but since we, we should have created a webhook event record. 
Looks like there's a bunch of posts. So let's go into the Rails console. New webhook event count. There's six. Let's check out the last. Let's also do created at time ago. Seconds. And new time helper. I don't even remember what <laughs> time ago in seconds. Okay. Maybe. Time dot done dot now. Or time dot now. Minus that time. 89 seconds. So that that's that probably makes sense. What was this webhook event about? Let's check out the data. Type is standard. Still doesn't really answer what I'm looking for. I'm still looking for like the type. So let's try to grab that code from the job. Or get the stripe object. We don't have webhook and the event defines. Gonna do it like this. Okay, now we have stripe object. We can get like the type, but I guess we can't. <laughs> we get object. Oh, this is annoying because I guess that's what happens when we just send the data and not the full event. We don't get the type of event that it is. I guess. Okay, we were gonna need to fix that code. Let's go back into the webhook events controller and then let's just pass in the event itself. I don't know. I feel like that's probably the best way to do it. Let's try it out. I guess we can try it out with a strike figure. Just check for any errors. In the console. Oh, we are in a pry. Oops. We're actually in a bunch of pries. So I'm guessing that would be in the account updated job. We actually have the stripe object. ID. And can we find find by strike account ID? Hey, we did find it. So we can already implement the code where we update. But I just want to quickly test out this new way of doing this. So let's exit out. Let's remove the whole binding pry thing too. Let's just try to reset this. Okay, and then I'm gonna test it one more time. Just see if there's any errors in our webhook event. No, it looks fine. So let's go look at that webhook event. Webhook event last. Check out the data. And now we get, well, a lot more information, I think. So I'm gonna set this to a variable. And I'm gonna go and grab that code again. We can create the stripe object. And just see what our stripe object looks like now. It's a stripe event. And then can we ask like the type? There we go. So that's what we we're missing. Now we can get the type off of it. Even though it just doesn't say type, it's probably somewhere nested inside. But it is the account updated type. And that's we should probably expect that since that's what we were already scoping it. But anyways, now I feel more comfortable with this setup. So once we get the stripe object. I want to get like the data. I don't even know how can I get certain things that I need. The account. Okay, so that gives me the ID of the account. Data. How about just typing objects? Okay. <laughs> You have to do all this nested stuff, data object dot 
Now I have to look and see like which capability are we even looking for. We want to see if like their status. Let's go check status. Maybe status somewhere in here. See, I need to really find out more about the account. So if we reload in our Stripe dashboard, we should see that, oh, this is weird. I got signed into the wrong account for a second. Let's reload. We should see that my account that I did go through the process with, it says its status is complete. So how can I check for this? So from the connect webhook, I just need to see more about this in the webhook documentation. Or possibly there's another link down there, event object reference. Because I am kind of looking through the event object. And I need to see more about it. Like, how do I find status? So I'm just going to search for status. The status of the webhook. It can be, no, not that one. Or maybe like the account. The connected accounts. It might just not have the information that I need. I really just don't know what event I'm looking for. for updates count requirements and status changes but how do I actually check like the status check status of accounts right okay, someone on stack overflow he's trying to get it too there's no status field on the account objects. Those status are likely inferred by looking at whether an account has charges and payouts enabled. Uh, <laughs> so charges enabled right here, payouts enabled, they're both to false. Oh, but the account, that's not my account ID, that's why. Okay, this is starting to make sense, because this account, if we go back, It doesn't really say the account ID, but it should somewhere. Account ID right here, it ends with a Q. It's actually different than this one. So. so that makes sense, actually. What we need to do is... Off of the stripe object, we need to figure out. I guess first I need to figure out which webhook event is the correct one. This one ends in it with a three. Or it ends with a Q. I think that's my one. So I'm gonna set it to variable. And then I'm just gonna look through here. See if anything looks like enabled. Payouts enabled false. 
or just enabled false, so it's not even enabled. I just need to figure out which field to use. Like payouts enabled. Charges enabled. Or is it both of them? I can just say like if stripe object dot where would it even be nested in inside of like data dot charges enabled then we're gonna wanna find data the ID or do we still need the object the data object We're gonna find the user by the Stripe account ID. And we can update Stripe status to complete. So right now we don't have a Stripe status field, but I'm gonna quickly add that with a migration. So add Stripe status to users. And Stripe status is gonna be an integer. All right, then I'm going to I just exit that, but I'm gonna go find that in the DB folder. And I'm gonna add a default zero. Then in the user model, I'm gonna add an enum. We're gonna do strike status. And I'll just pass in an array. Ending. Complete. So it defaults to zero, which would be pending, and then complete is just going to be one. That's kind of how it works. All right. So once it is complete, we'll just update it like this. Should be fine. Okay, now we can go and test this out. Let's run that migration. Now it's already this, but I think if I confirm it, it'll actually send another event, maybe. Probably. It should send a webhook. Let's see. I mean, I didn't really see anything. I wonder if there's a way we could trigger a webhook event. <laughs> or like, can't you resend events, I'm pretty sure? If you go over to developers, webhooks. Yeah, I don't know if we can do that. Logs. We have the logs for the webhook events. Yeah, I wish it had a history of the webhook events. Which maybe they do up here. I guess they do. Hmm. Count updated. When was that? 1848? That was like a a little bit ago. Stripe event. Stripe events resend. Oh, we can if we have the ID. So I'm going to go do that. Stripe events resend. This resource missing, so we couldn't really do that. This is interesting.
if I just come back here up into the, for the last time that we updated it. Grab that event. No, it's still not working. Okay, fine. I guess what I'll do is I'll go and I'll disconnect this account again and I'll just have to go through the process one more time. Remove account. Account removed, and then, oh, right, we have to manually go remove it from the console. So it's updated the Stripe account ID to nil. So now when we press this button, it'll create a new Stripe account, which we're going to have to fill out the information for. I'm starting to get into the process and it's pretty clean, simple. All right, so I'm almost done setting up this account. It's really just a few steps and I'm gonna skip most of them. And we're gonna agree. And this is where the webhook should hit the back end and update the account, which I don't know if it ever did. So we can check in the console. Oh, the straight status is still pending. Look at that. So it looks like whenever the account... Oh, there's actually an error in here. So something must have happened. Undefined method charge is enabled. Oh. Let's try to figure out what the webhook event was. Like what, the, what the webhook event ID was. Job ID. I don't know if we can pull up the job ID. But we do see the webhook events controller has this event ID. So let's try to look for that in the console. So I'm going to reload. Look for <coughs> webhook event where. The event ID. Right, so we actually found it. And then we can check the event dot data. See so we have this. Now there's something went wrong in this check. So we forget the stripe object. And then we are checking if charge is enabled, but I guess that method's not defined, so we got this error. I never got to test with it yet. So let's see where is the real method for charges enabled. I don't even see anything. Charges enabled is right here. So we should have been able to do it. Charge enabled, but apparently it's in. Oh, look. So that's weird. Data object charged. Oh, there's just a typo. That's my fault. <laughs> I didn't even see the typo, but sometimes that happens. So, but then, yeah, we could just update the status. We can actually do that right now with the new code, but we can be confident that future accounts will update. Oh, undefined method object. So I guess that was the inner code. no object so maybe just data no wait webhook event oh don't use the webhook event use the stripe object dot data dot object there we go so let me go place this code back and then I'll actually just run all this code in the console real quick we updated the user. Now if we check user.last strike status, it's complete. It's perfect, because then we can do some more stuff on the front end to let them know that they're ready. Actually, like once they're complete, it means they can start listing houses. So we've already completed that portion of the logic, which is adding Stripe accounts, connecting, and then you having an embedded form too. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to the owner sign up show page. Actually, I'm not. I'm gonna go into the controllers 
uh, listings controller, right? And then inside of the redirect to sign up, let's say if current user dot, uh, we actually should have this method complete, completed, right? Because we called it, no, we called it complete. <laughs> So if it's not completed, it's just complete. If current user complete, which that doesn't really make sense, so it might be better to just say if current user stripe status equal complete. How about if stripe status equals pending, then we redirect to owner sign up path. Basically, otherwise we don't do any sort of redirecting. Let's see what that looks like. So if we go to new listing, oh, we can actually create a new listing. So I'm going to create a listing inspired by some houses. I don't know where I'm going to do them. I'm just going to look for, let's do lakefront. Okay, here's a little house. So I'll save the images. I'm just going to take this title, put it in there. I don't have the address, so let's just do Lakeway Maps. And I can just come in here, grab a random house address. And for the description, I'm going to take some of that description, then let's put the images in. You can select all of these. Five bedrooms, three bathrooms, eight people, maybe. Boom, just like that. We created a new listing. This is pretty exciting. And then from here, we can do more styling on this page. But the next thing that I really want to implement is the booking feature so that people can come and book stays now that the user has the stripe off. And we might also add some more styling or like add some more UI to show a way to interact with your stripe account and then if you want to like unenable but honestly this is pretty exciting so far just getting it this far where you can connect your account and start accepting payments so i want to get to that to accepting payments and doing the bookings right away all right let's get back to where we left off and the last thing i was doing was i set up stripe accounts and then once you do have your Stripe account set up, you can go and create a new listing. So this is a pretty big step in this guide because that's kind of like the main point of Airbnb is it's a platform to rent houses and it allows the owners of the houses to make money off the listings. So that's actually the next thing that we're gonna to wanna to add in probably is when you edit a listing to add like a price to it. And then also, I don't know if we've ever set like owners, we never associated an owner to a house because in the past we were just creating listings. And that also means that as an owner who doesn't own this listing, I can go and edit the listing, which shouldn't be allowed. So overall, I'm probably just gonna transfer all of these houses over to my user right here that I have created. Which right now we don't have any information filled out about the user, but we're able to find them if we go into the Rails console. So I'm going to open up a new tab, make sure that I'm inside of the app, and then I can do a rail C. And if I just type in user.last, we're able to find that user. And then if I was going to say like dot listings, we don't have any method called listings. So we really need to add this all together and make this work. So what I'm going to do is I'll add a new migration. So I'll type in rails G migration, add user to listings. And then user is going to belong to. So this is going to add a new field. If we want to check out what the migration generated, we can look at that file. And it's just adding this code to basically add a new user reference, which just means it's going to add like a user ID. It's also going to set the foreign key. So now we know about a user on the listing. The next thing we can do is go into the code and go to our models folder. And then... <clears throat> The next thing we should do is go into our code and then head over to the app models folder. And inside of here, we're gonna add the code that connects the user to the listing. So 
So inside of the user.rb, I'm going to add has many listings. So a user has many different listings. And then inside of the listing.rb, I'll set the association to the user by saying belongs to user. Now you can put this wherever you want in the model, but I usually try to organize these together, like all the associations together. And then I probably do the belongs to before the has many because the belongs to is like your parents and then has many is like their children, if that makes sense. So you can only have one, but when you do a belongs to, you can only have one item. But when you has many, you have multiple associations. And then if you did want to tie in like, you know, one model, but having multiple different parents, uh, I will get to that later in like other tutorials, but I've done that. I think I did that in maybe like one of my other tutorials where I was talking about creating likes or something. Or I don't even know if I have went over that yet. That's still a topic that I'll have to get to. Anyways, with this done, we have the code in place that associates the user and the listing. So now I'm going to just go and update all of those listings that we already have. So I can go in URL C. I can just do a listing.all. Let's count them first. We have four listings. And then what I can do is just do listing.all.updateAll. User is going to be user.last. And we get this error. That's kind of weird. Can't cast user. Okay, maybe we can't do an update all. We can't put in like a model. So we have to say user ID is user.last.id. Now I run this and it says column user ID of relation listing does not exist. Oh, wait, did I never migrate the database? I think I only looked at the migration. I never migrated the database. So you have to do a Rails DB migrate. Okay, and we still get an error. Column user ID of relation listings contains no value. Oh, right. Because, so basically our migration is saying that in the last migration, we said no false. So when we're trying to run this, it's getting an error because there's already listings that don't have a user. So the user ID would be no. So actually we're gonna have to, I think we're gonna have to allow no true just for a second. <laughs> now we can migrate the database like you saw it worked. Now go into the console, rel C, and I'll just update all the listings with the new user ID. Okay, perfect. So now all those listings will now belong to that user. And any future listings we can make sure belong to users too, but we're gonna have to go and update the controllers. So inside the controllers folder, we have to go to listings controller and I'll have to change how the listings are getting created. So the first one is the listings index. This is what we use to show all of the listings. So actually this should stay the same because we're gonna wanna show all the listings that are available. But when it comes to the new listing, we're probably going to want to initialize this off of the user. So you can say current user dot listings dot new. And more importantly, when we're doing a create, we're going to do current user dot listings dot new also here so that it'll have the user reference. And then for update for set listing, I think this is fine to just find the listing by the ID. Although we're gonna to need to add some authorization now so that only the users that own the listings can actually edit them. Because right now anybody can go here. If I go into a new incognito window, I'm still editing this and I'm not even signed in. So see, that's a bad thing. We're gonna to need to, to add some authorization. So let's do authorization, not on the show page, cause that's fine, but on the edit, update and destroy. We're going to need to definitely authenticate the listing that we're on. So what I'll do is, oh, and on redirect to sign up for a new listing. I don't know if that's taking effect. Let's go back into incognito. So what happens if I go to slash listing slash new? Right away, it says undefined method stripe status for nil. So we're gonna to need to go into that method because we have this other method we created earlier, redirect to sign up. If current user stripe status equals pending, we probably wanna add another condition here. 
So really, we want to redirect to root path if not current user. And then we can even put a message in, like alert. You must sign in before you. Or actually, we don't. We probably don't want to redirect to root path. We can just redirect them to new user session path, so they have to sign in. And then we'll just say you must sign in before you can create a listing. Now let's reload over here in the incognito browser. Let's see what happens. So we still get, oh, it's still going to the next step. So actually we need to add a return. And here in the listings controller. Funny enough how the methods work, it's even though we redirect the page, right? It's still gonna go to the next code and then it would break here because of the syntax. So there we go. If we tried to create that new listing, like we did before, let me just do it. The weird thing is I don't see an alert. I wonder if we skip that, if I skipped showing the alerts. Real quickly, let's go over to the views, layouts, application. No, we are showing alerts. Oh, I know what's happening. So they're getting hidden by the navbar because of the navbar's absolute position. It's actually hiding the alert behind it. So what we're gonna wanna do is go to the alerts partial and then, honestly, we're going to make these absolute as well. Absolute. And then it's going to have to be a larger, or like more top, because top is going to push it down from the top of the page. It needs to be a little bit more than the nav bar if we want to see that message. So let's take, let's check it out now. I'm going to go to the new listings page. And boom, just like that, we see our error right here. And it's actually like absolute positioned which means well I thought it would scroll let's add some blue backgrounds on here but look we do get the error invalid email or password but it kind of like it also goes over the navbar it will do the Z zero Try to push it under. And then we can also go to the nav bar and make, uh, like, increase this Z index. Z50. Okay, look, and now the nav bar is actually going over the alert. But my question is, why is the alert not staying? Like, because our nav bar, we're doing fixed. Maybe it's fixed. Maybe I have to change absolute to fixed. Let's see. Oh yeah, there we go. Do we really want our alert to follow us though? Not really. So I guess absolute is fine. And then what I'll probably do is I'll style these alert and notice uh, different divs a little bit differently. Like I'm still going to use the base styling. We can uh, have both of them be like rounded with some padding. But the notice should be a little bit more like happy. We do text green 500. And then let's add like a border green 500. And then we can do the same styling, but I'll just change it to red for the alert. And let's take a look at what that looks like real quick. Oh. <laughs> so you have this kind of like funny look. Now it kind of looks like Italian because it's like green and red. But I need to add a conditional around the P. Because what's happening is even though there's no text inside of the notice, the styling is getting applied and because of the padding, because of the border, we're just seeing an empty div that's still showing. That's why we do a conditional around the HTML content. So we can say if flash notice.present is usually what I do. Then we would show the notice and then the same thing for the alert. All right, so now it's not showing, but then we do get an alert. Uh, well, it should have popped up. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't use the present. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to change this to flash alert present. There we go. So now it pops up, although it looks kind of like a button. Maybe we should do top 16. 
that might fit a little bit better okay that's good but yeah it's still <laughs> let's get rid of the border because it looks like a button what i'm really going for is like a white alert let's add bg white bg shadow well, actually that's on the notice We don't really see anything. Wait, BG shadow, that's not anything. I meant to say shadow large. All right, so it's just like a little pop up. I don't know, I might put it on the right side. So we can say, I honestly do with full flex justify end. I think that might push it over. There we go. And then we might want to do a border, just like a really small one. We do border and then border gray 900. So then an alert would look like this. It still kind of looks like a button with the border. <laughs> huh. So we might want to think like maybe only doing a border bottom, the border B. Just how can we make it look more like an alert? Well, that doesn't really look right. Valid email or password. Well, one way to make it more look more like an alert is to add an icon. So since we have font awesome icons, why don't we just find an error icon for the alert at least? And then we can find something else or the other one, so maybe like exclamation point. You could try this. So I'll just put it in here right before the alert. I might have to change up the styling a little bit. Let's check it out. So yeah, that looks pretty much like an alert. We might want to add more padding and like push it over a bit. So let's do a max width on this MX Auto. Well, I don't know if MX Auto is going to work in this situation <laughs> it kind of just pushes it into the center uh, yeah we might want to do flex justified center and then have another div inside probably a good way to do this the max width and then I'm just going to quickly add a background to test. All right, so now it looks like the size is right, but now our alert is just taking up too much of that div. So I'm going to go back into the code, and I'm going to try to figure this out. So really what we want to do is this inner div, because it's stretching 5XL, that's what's giving it the size. But what we need to do is say flex, justify end, so we can push that alert over to the right. Now when we reload, we'll see that the alert pops up right there. There is still the green background. So I'm going to delete this BG green from this div. And now we get this nice alert kind of pop up. And I think that looks pretty good. We can always work on it later. And if we go to try to create a new listings, we get this nice pop up that says I need to sign in. Okay, cool. So now let's get to the rest of the authorization. So I forgot we're in incognito. I'm going to go back to this listing and now I just want to make sure that only the owner of the listing can actually edit this listing that we're on. So we're going to do some authorization in the listings controller. What we're going to do is we're going to add another before action, which will just be called authorized owner. And then we're only going to do it on the edit the update and the destroy also another thing to note is I'm, I'm doing it after set listing because i want to already have the listing like the at listing available and then we only need to do it for these edit update and destroy routes because those are the ones that we want to hide from anybody who doesn't actually own the listing then down in the private section, we can define that method, authorize owner. And we'll say redirect to 
root path. You know, let's add an alert that says like you are not allowed to uh, view this page or something. And then we'll say if current user not equal to at listing dot user. So we're comparing the user that signed in with the listings user, so the owner of the listing. If they're not the same, then we're gonna just redirect. So let's take a look at how that works. So if we reload right here, I am the owner, so I'm able to edit the listing. If I wanna change something about this, let's add a smiley face. Update the listing, you'll see that it still shows that smiley face. But if I go into incognito window, and go to the same route, and edit listing, we get this alert, you are not allowed to view this page. So that's perfect. We've already implemented authorization. Although really we shouldn't show the edit link unless you're the user who can edit it. So we can quickly change that. If we go to the views listings, for the show page, then we can look for that edit listing route, which is right up here. And let's just say if current user equaled at listing.user. So that's how we authorize. And this condition on this link what it means is that now when I reload in incognito, or even if I sign up as a new account, let's sign up as a new account, and then I go and try to, like even if I hack the URL, go to the edit page, it just says you're not allowed to view this page. So I'm not able to do it. And then if I want to create a new listing, I can, but I have to go through the sign up process. This is already, this app is coming along, like uh, it's actually looking pretty good. We have the settings page, we have this new listing logic. And uh, yeah, the only thing from now, from here is just adding the booking section so that you can book or you can reserve a spot and then probably like some more improvements to the app from there. All right, so now that we have the user accounts associated to the listings and we also set up the authorization, the next thing that I'm gonna start working on is adding the booking section. So that's a pretty important part of this series and it's gonna be exciting to add. So really the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a price field onto this form so we can set how much a listing it should cost per day. And then actually for Airbnb, sometimes they have weekly or they have like deals where if you stay a week or if you stay a month, there's a different price. So we might want to have prices for each different, like we might want to do a price per day and then a price per week and a price per month. And then those will automatically get set. Like if you don't set them, then they'll just go to the price per day. We can do something like that. So I guess what I'll do is I'll go into the console and I'm going to add, I'm going to create a new migration for these changes. So I'll write Rails G migration, add price fields to listings and then I'm just gonna add per day maybe like price per day or we could call it day price and this will probably be type decimal and then we could have week price we could have weekly price That's kind of better and then also monthly price these are all going to be type decimals because just in case the owner wants to put like 99 cents or something, I don't know. We could force them to use decimals too, but or we could force them to use integers so that they can't have it. They can't put like the amount of cents. So I think it's fine to just do decimal. And once we have that migration, we can just let that go through. And if we wanted to also edit the migration, that might be a good idea. We can go in here and then add like a step. get in here I forget how to do this too I'm gonna have to look it up real quick add step to decimal this is like this precision 10 scale 6 for money So it says precision eight scale two. Scale is the number of digits to the right of the decimal point. Precision is the total amount of numbers. 
What if there's more than just eight, though? Is this much safer and easier to use an integer in combination with Axis dollars? That's what somebody else says. If you need a number greater than a million, then increase the precision. Precision eight is only a million, but there could be, potentially there could be Airbnbs that are listed for like more than a million dollars per day or per month or per, definitely per month. So we can't use precision eight. Maybe we'll just do scale. We'll just leave it up to using scale. So I'll go back into that migration. Just put scale two. All right. And then I'm just gonna migrate the database. Go Rails DB migrate. We get an error. It says error adding precision cannot be empty if scale is specified. Whoops. Okay, I guess. <laughs> I'm actually gonna just remove this scale. I don't want to set precision because I don't know if we're gonna really have a max number. Now I'm gonna migrate the database with Rails DB migrate, and then I can start the server with bin slash dev. Now when I reload, I see something like this, but we don't have any price field on the page. So I'm gonna quickly add that in the code. So to do that, I'm gonna go into our code for our app and I'll go to the listings underscore form partial. And then what I'll do is I'll just copy one of these other number fields we had for like people limit. And I'll just change this to our new attribute which is, we actually have a few of them. So day price, let's just see how that looks real quick. So we can do like 15.99 if we wanted to. Now day price, it doesn't really read that well. Like, so we might wanna add a custom label, price slash day, we could do something like that. And then we could also do a placeholder So placeholder is just like some sample text that'll show up. And it could be like 15, or no, <laughs> I don't even know. Just like some money, just to show off like what you're supposed to put in, price per day. See, that looks pretty good. And then what we can do is we can just copy this div, and I'll change it from day price to monthly price, and then price slash month. And for placeholder, I guess it might be more like, who knows how much they're gonna pay for, for a month. Actually, I forgot the week, so I'm gonna copy this, drop it in the center and change it to week. And then weekly price. And then we might change the placeholder. Thousand. But they can obviously set this to whatever they want. And then to get it to save in the back end, I need to go quickly edit the controllers. Let's go to controllers and listings controller. And then inside of the listing params, we're gonna allow these new attributes. So day price, weekly price, and monthly price. And just like that, we're gonna be able to fill in this form with this information maybe it's like 150 a day 1000 per week 2500 per month so there's like a little bit of a discount although <laughs> wait is that a discount with 150 times seven 150 times five is 750 so it's like a tiny bit of a discount doesn't really matter though right we can help them figure that out later. But what we're gonna do now is, well, they don't really show like all the stuff right off the bat, but they might have like say, they might say something like starting at this much per night. We can go ahead and add that somewhere into our page. So first of all, we might wanna think about where we wanna put that. 
And maybe we could put it at the end of this description or we could also put it after these cards. I think I'll put it after the cards, like just keep it simple. So I'll go to the listing show page. Then down here we can go after this div. I might just collapse that code for a second. And then climb down here and just create. So let's get started by saying starting at listing the a price per day or per night like you're going to be staying there for the night starting at 150 per night okay so we can make that look a little bit better we could have a number the currency use that as a helper we'll transform it into like a money sort of value and then we can also do some more things like add some margin on the top to push this down starting at 159 and we want to make this like pop out so I think I'll make the text larger and then we could put like the money we could put that inside of a span and then we could put some styling on the span so span is just like another type of element that I use when I don't know like it's not a div and I'm also like putting it in the middle of text so I just call it a span for different reasons and then we might do like let's do a gradient actually easy gradient to r to the right from the red color to like a pink color we can also make this rounded large and add a little bit of padding you know what? i'm gonna do rounded full i like where this is going and we can do text red 100 for like a light text starting at there we go starting at 150 per night and like it looks kind of bright happy now i think the span having this is kind of interrupting the text so i might want to add some margin mx1 so i can push the text on both sides a little bit and yeah this looks pretty good it's starting at you know 150 per night we might have the text inside of the little button looking thing i might make this a little smaller text small since we have the padding just so it fits in and then you know like you scroll down here you see like starting at this much per night we might even want to put this somewhere up like more visible maybe on top of the cards let's try to do that go back in the code let's take this div and let's put it right underneath the description and then just like a little pop-up yeah i think that looks a little bit nicer we might even center it on the right side I think I might like that. We can do ML auto. Boom, okay. Yeah, that's cool, starting at this. And maybe we don't even need this whole margin thing. I mean, there's probably gonna be some sort of space. So let's do like M margin top four. So I wanna keep this space kinda condensed. Also, these cards are doing a margin top eight, so we might wanna decrease that to four as well yeah this is kind of easy to digest from here actually i might want to center this see how this looks in the center so let's do mx auto I mean, yeah it looks kind of nice because it all flows together and then any further styling from here uh, we could work on but really from here i think i want to add some sort of calendar that will show the available days like the days that aren't booked and then it'll also show you how much it is per day and then if you select like a few dates it'll show you the weekly price all right so previously we were just adding in this fields like for how much it would cost to stay per night and then also we have the weekly price and the next thing i wanted to do is have some sort of view where you could schedule your booking and then you could see like the full price so obviously this UI right here, uh, it's not looking correct if we haven't set the price. So we might just want to hide that. So what we can do is we can just go ahead and hide this field if we don't have this listing day price. So I'll just wrap it in a conditional. If listing day price, then we'll show 
this content. And if I reload, you'll see that we don't see that um, anymore. But if I were, if I was going to go and edit this listing, which I can't edit it because I need to sign into the account. But if I was to edit that and add a price, then the link would show up. Just like this house, where you see that it's starting at this much per night. Yeah, that's how I have it set up. So from here, I want to set up the booking page, or at least like some sort of preview page to see what the like what it what the timeline looks like for available bookings. This is gonna be a really exciting part of the video where we get into building this logic for doing a booking, showing like which nights are already reserved, and just all different things like that. So let's just go ahead and get right into it. I think what I'm gonna need is another page for booking, and then I'll just leave it as like a booking page for right now. So the first thing I'm going to do to create a new page is I'll go to the config routes.rb and I'm going to figure out where I want to have the route. So up here we had this resources listings do and then we had to get photos which we had like this photos method on the listings controller. So we could do that for bookings but it might just get kind of it's already pretty congested inside of the listings controller. You know, like there's a lot of stuff going on. There's even like all this stuff that we have just from the scaffold, like doing the format JSON. Like you don't use this unless you're using an API. So this doesn't really make sense. But we already have our app set up like for APIs. So I guess that could be cool. But this photos method, see, it's just kind of like out there. We could add a booking method too, but I feel like it'll just clog up the controller. So we might want to go and a new controller inside of the listings folder like we have the file uploads controller and we can put another one but the difference between file uploads and photos is that file uploads just using listings as the namespace if you look at this so it's not expecting an id so if we want to actually get the listing id in the url we're going to put our route up here inside of this resource you know what, I'm going to go ahead and drag this resource down next to the namespace, just so we can see, like, this is the resources, this is the namespace. So if you want to see what that looks like, URLs that go slash listings. So this is what the URL would look like, slash listing slash file uploads. But up here... URLs that use the listing ID. Which could be like listings. And then actually gonna use Right, so now I think you can understand why we'd want to add the booking route onto this resources so that we can get the house that it's supposed to be at. And then we can have our route that'll look like listings then the house and then bookings slash new kind of a long URL but at least it's easy to understand and like when you're sharing it it'll kind of make sense and then if we wanted to override some of these routes and have them like a little bit more cleaner we could do that too in the future but what I'm just gonna get into is I'm gonna add our nested resource for the bookings but I'm actually going to first do this in a scope. So scope module listings. And that's just going to mean that it's going to look for this resource inside of a scoped module, which is basically the same as just having like a folder. Remember how we have a module, it's a namespace, different things. So having the scope module is just going to namespace it in the listings like as that's the parent and then inside of here we can do resources bookings only new and create and now the reason why i'm doing resources instead of just resource is because i actually want to have possibly like a a booking object we're actually going to create a booking object so we could also have like a show page and then it would pass in the id 
whereas the resource it doesn't have any sort of like model that you're creating it's just a one-off route that you're going to use as like or like a one-off controller that you're not actually going to have like an edit or an update or a show so that's kind of the difference but now that we have this resources bookings uh our app is going to have a new route for bookings but it's going to expect to have a bookings controller so we can just go ahead and create that real quick so we have to go over to the controllers folder and then inside of it we do need a listings folder which we already have so we can just go in here create a new file in the bookings controller and then remember inside we're going to have a module for listings because that's the namespace and then we're going to have our bookings controller which can inherit from the application controller and then inside of here i'm just going to put a new and then also a create and i'm just doing a one-liner which means like you can put a semicolon and then have the end on the same line this is just some syntax in your ruby uh, you don't have to worry about that but now we have a new and create action then it's also going to expect to have a view that corresponds so what we have to do is we have to have this namespace also in the views so we have to have inside of the listings folder a bookings folder and then inside of here we can have that new template so create a file called new.html.erb and then inside of here i'll just put a little message create new booking just like that now what i'm going to do is we don't have any like link to create the booking so we're going to have to add that in somewhere maybe right next to this link like starting at this per night and it'll say like book now or like checkout bookings or something so let's go to that page so inside the views folder in the listings folder on the show page this is where we're going to go and then i'm going to find that message which is right here if listing day price and then what we can do is let's just put another link at the end link to uh book now and this is going to go to the new listing booking path so i know this looks weird but this is just kind of how it works in with the url helpers so you put the new first and then you have the namespace which is listing underscore booking and then you pass in the listing because it's going to expect that id in the url and then just like that you're good to go and we can add more styling so for this I might do like we already have this whole gradient thing on the span but we could do maybe like a green maybe a gradient also to our maybe to bottom 300 and we can just see what that looks like probably gonna look pretty bad at first the margin on the side let's take a look okay it's starting at 150 per night and then book now so that's kind of like <laughs> pretty big text i don't know it looks kind of weird maybe we could get rid of the styling on this because i don't think this should pop out as a button i do like the colors you know what let's do is instead of having like a pill background you know what i mean like the circle background that makes it look like a button why don't we take the same gradient and put it as the color of the text so you can do that with styling and also with tailwind so what we can do is let's get rid of text small so it's still going to be regular size let's get rid of the padding leave the margin because we still want to push like margin between the sides of the like the other text and then also get rid of rounded full we don't need that and then leave the gradient and then what we're going to do is bg clip text so this is going to make the background like it somehow makes the background work as the color of the text or maybe it, i don't even know what it does it's just like maybe it makes a mask around the text and it inserts the background into it and then you do text transparent so we also have to get rid of text red 100 because we're going to make the text transparent and then so yeah, you make the text transparent and then the background of the element fills 
where the text should be, which gives you this nice custom color for the text. And it's cool because this would work with anything. Like I'm pretty sure you could just put a background image inside of text, and I've done that before if you want to get really artistic. But now this kind of looks like a little bit different, and then we could make this book now button a little bit less pronounced. We can make this, we can give it a text small class book now, and it says like starting at $150. We could also try adding a border, border B. And I really don't know if we can do the whole like gradient thing on the border. I would like to, but let's just do like border pink 500 or pink 600 like the same as the end of the gradient okay something like that starting at 150 dollars per night book now and then i was just having the idea it's maybe it'll be cool if when we hover on this section it kind of like highlights the book now because we can do that with some styling with uh, tailwind css so what we can do is add the group class to this element and then whenever you hover on the group i want to add some custom styling to book now so we can do that right here at the end we'll add the group hover modifier so maybe i'll put this on a new line so whenever we hover on the group think about what type of styling we could have so there's some animate stylings and with animate tailwind css that i might look at real quick we have ping that's a good one although that i think that affects the size we have spin, so we can kind of take a look at what this looks like. See right here, it kind of makes this element ping. I like that for notifications. We have pulse, which makes an element gently fade in and out, which that could be good for loaders. Oh, we have bounce. I think I want to use bounce, animate bounce. So group hover, animate bounce. And this is going to give us a kind of a funny effect where when you hover, Oh, it's not working. Group hover. We have the group class. Let's just try animate bounce without group. Oh, it's not even bouncing. There's, there's some problem. Like moving it to a new line or something. I don't see it bouncing. How about animate pulse? Look, the pulse one works, but the animate bounce didn't work. That was weird. I just don't see it bouncing. We are doing bin dev, so it should be working, but I don't know, it's not. Uh, Okay, what's another effect we could do? I really like the animate effects, but I think you can do custom animations too. I just don't really know much about it. I'm going to look up some Tailwind CSS custom animations. It would be cool if there was a library or like a framework of already pre-made animations. Oh yeah, because you can do, I forgot about this, but you can do keyframe transforms and like just make stuff happen with different keyframes. That's pretty cool. Look at all these animations they have in here. Not only is all really not that much, just like this simple stuff. audio player animation for the play button. Pulsing. It's pretty cool. Yeah, there's just like so much to get into with animations, although I do love animations. I don't know. I see, it'd be cool to have like, we could do a scale type of change. 105, like imagine you hover and then this link just suddenly gets bigger. That'd be kind of weird. Let's try it out. Group hover. 
scale 105 go by like 0.05%, it would get bigger. Although it's not working. Let's try just hover. I don't know why some of this stuff isn't working. Look, like the hover class, that's kind of weird. How about hover yellow 500 or BG yellow 500. So I'm gonna change up the background when you hover. Look, nothing. So that kind of gives me a sign right there. I mean, I was already seeing it before, but I think there's an issue with Tailwind. Maybe from what I did earlier, how I was starting the app with Rails S. I don't know how that could be a problem, but I'm guessing that there's some compiled Tailwind class that's overriding the custom styling. That's kind of what it looks like to me. Because nothing else would explain the hover to yellow not working. So we're going to have to... Basically, do a rail to assets clobber. That should do it. And then we can also do a temp clear, although that'll, if we remove the temp, it'll remove our images that we have already in our app. So I don't really want to have to do that. Let me restart the server. Okay. The hover still doesn't work. This is pretty strange. If we just do BG yellow 500, no hover, not yellow. BG yellow 500. This one's yellow. Hmm. I don't get it. BG yellow, now it's yellow. <laughs> so like, it's just weird. I wanted this to work with my group hover, but like it's not working. Group hover. BG green 500. I just want something to work, come on. Oh, right, look, our booking page actually did work. I spent all this time trying to get the styling to do something magical. But when you click on it, it does work. So we don't really have to get too caught up on a little thing like this. Although I think it would be nice if we could color this element. How about we try to change like the two red 500. So we change the gradient. Oh, look, that works. Maybe we should have to work with what we have. Hover from pink 600. So I kind of want to go with the same styling that we had. Oh, that looks kind of cool. So it goes from green to red. And then we could also do other animate pulse. Although the pulse might be kind of weird. It's like book now. And maybe what should happen actually is that when you click, how about when you click anywhere on this, like this text, it brings you to the booking page because that kind of makes more sense at this point. So to do that, I'm actually going to have to change this link and just wrap this whole div. And I do want to still have this button here. I just want to swap this out pretty easily. So I'm going to go with content tag, span, and this will actually allow us to create like a span the same as the one that we have here but with Ruby code and then let's get rid of this route. Actually, I'm going to relocate it. And just like this, this is another way to create a span with Ruby code. If we reload, now we have just literally like a, a, a thing that doesn't do anything. You click on it, it doesn't do anything. So that's an easy way to switch a link to just to like a regular element. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this whole div and a link to add a do to make it a block and then we also need the end like always and just like that we have a link that's wrapping this whole section oh and look at that the styling got a little bit messed up because we were using the div to position this element in the dom so like in the html in the page i guess <laughs> i don't know why i said dom i haven't said that in forever what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna take the mx auto and the margin top four actually i'm gonna take both of these 
and put it onto the link itself. Hope that that'll affect the styling good enough. Let's take a look. Oh, it worked. And now when you hover on this whole section, it lights up. Another thing we could do is add an underline on the rest of the text when you hover. That might be kind of cool. So we could do like a border to border pink 600. But we want to do it on hover, right? Whoops. And border B2. Let's do hover. Well, that kind of looks weird because it goes across the whole element. So I guess I didn't want to do that. But let's copy this code. And oh, yeah, because I want to affect these two pieces of text. That's what I want to do, like mostly. So I guess we should just put a span around them. And then just add the class. But instead of hover, do group hover. Group hover, and then make sure to end off the element. So we just wrap that text in a span. And now if I reload, take a look at what happens. But it's not really the same as that one though. So let's make sure that that border is the same. I think it's because I did border two. Definitely, we're just trying to do a smaller border. It is kind of weird how it doesn't connect. That's the only thing. So we might want to just wrap this, like all this text in a span, which is kind of what we're doing with the div, but not really. So maybe we can just have like another div actually. Starting at, we have the span thing. And then that's it, we end the div. And then we have the link. And then we can get rid of the border on the number, unless we always want it to be showing. Ooh, and now our book now is on the other, we need to do flex, same page. But then I also have to do item center, push that button in the center. There we go. Although the border kind of pushes away, look how the border resizes the text. I think what we need to do is have a border bottom, but then have the border transparent until we hover on it and turn it pink. And just like that, you'll see that the text does not move when you hover. Now this, we did all that work just for this like simple effect that's kind of weird. Like the green to red looks kind of like Christmas, which I don't know if that many people are feeling. I'm not really feeling it anymore. So let's get rid of the green. So instead of green, let's do like some sort of bright color, like from purple to pink. There we go. And boom, starting at 150 per night. You click here and then it's like, boom, you're going to book your listing basically. So on the booking page is where we're going to get into like creating a fully styled page to book your listing and then choose the nights that you want to stay and create your whole plan. So this is going to be really exciting to get into and to just see like maybe we're going to use a library, maybe we're not going to, maybe we'll do it just by hand. I don't know, I'm going to have to think about it. But let's just start styling this so it looks a little bit nicer. And we can even probably do like the most basic setup first and then kind of get into a more advanced workflow. Let's go back into the code. Let's go to the listings folder, bookings new. This is where we have all the code set up. And then I'm just gonna wrap this in a div. Match it by so. And then really in its most simplest way, we'd have a form with the model is gonna be the booking, which we don't even have like a booking model yet, I don't think. So we define the booking inside of the booking controller in the new action. So I'm going to get rid of that semicolon. And then we just define it right here. So the booking would be off the listing, which we don't have the listing either. So actually, let's define that first. So in this bookings controller, 
I'm going to create a before action set listing because we're already getting like the listing ID in the params. We just need to set it. So I'm going to go into a private section by writing private. And then underneath the private, I'm going to create a method called set listing. Inside of set listing, we're going to get listing from listing dot probably friendly finds, just like we did in the other controller. And then it would be the listing ID. So we're going to be able to grab the listing. And then on the new, we would set the booking equals at listing dot bookings dot new. Right? So we don't have a booking model though. Like we don't have a thing like this. So we're going to need to create bookings. If you go over to